red means it's hot. Well, this is, if I'm behind you.
Good morning. Welcome you to the first uh, meeting on stable coins. We'll have our hearing today entitled Understanding Stable Coins Role in the Payments and the Need for Legislation. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I want to thank our witnesses for all being here today. And I'd now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening comment. Today's hearing marks the official resumption of the House Financial Services Committee efforts to enact payment stablecoin legislation. Last Congress, Democrats and Republicans worked together on a proposal to bring about payment stablecoin issuers under a regulatory framework in the United States and allow stablecoins to unlock their potential as a contributor to a modern payment system. That proposal from September was noticed for today's hearing. Last year, members from both sides of the aisle reviewed the proposal, provided feedback, and worked to reach a compromise. But the clock ran out on those efforts due to the fall elections. That bill is an infant. It's a baby. It's not necessarily a beautiful baby, but it's, it's our baby, and it's named Maxine McHenry. And so it's here today for both sides of the aisle to review and consider and to hear from our panelists. So today we're going to discuss it, think about revisions, how do we address the benefits and risks described in the Biden administration's 2021 report on stablecoins. The Financial Stability Oversight Council recommended that Congress pass a legal framework, and Chairman McHenry and I are committed to working across the aisle to pass payment stablecoin legislation, and we're hopeful that members in this room on both sides of the aisle will build on the foundation of that work. Luckily, we've made significant headway with the proposal that we've noticed. By requiring payment stablecoins to be backed one for one by high quality liquid assets held in reserve, the proposal mitigates run risk. The legislation also requires stablecoin issuers to comply with redemption requirements, monthly attestation and disclosures, and risk management standards. These are just a few ways that this legislation established strong, much needed consumer protections in this area, just as Ms. Reynolds hands outlines in her testimony today. However, there's more work to be done. It's my goal that our payment stablecoin legislation will provide different ways for issuers to maintain and come into compliance. I believe innovation is fostered through choice and competition. And one way to do that is through multiple pathways to become a stablecoin issuer though with appropriate protections so we prevent regulatory arbitrage or a race to the bottom. I'm glad to have Superintendent Harris here from the New York Department of Financial Services to explain the framework that's currently in place in New York and discuss their requirements for payment stablecoin issuers. Finally, I want to reiterate the urgency for those of us in this room to work together and pass this needed legislation. Recent reports indicate that the digital asset developers are leaving the United States to go to countries that have more established regulatory frameworks for digital assets. That's not good for innovation, jobs, or consumer or investor protection here. The ongoing turf war between the SEC and the CFTC over digital assets is also just unhelpful, but it's also unsustainable. When you have two agencies contradicting each other about whether one of the most utilized stable coins in the market is either a security or a commodity, you end up with uncertainty. Federal regulators have made it abundantly clear that without an act of Congress, they will continue to interpret their authorities broadly, even when in direct contradiction with each other. That's why it's time for Congress to act and pass legislation to establish a regulatory framework for payment stable coins. We look forward to hearing from our witnesses, and I look forward to picking up where we left off last fall. Now let me turn to the ranking member and recognize him for four minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing to further examine the role of stable coins in our financial system. I'd like to also thank the witnesses for their appearance here to help the committee with its work. Thank you. The last several months have marked the effective collapse of much of the crypto industry following the abrupt demise of Tether FTX, Silvergate Bank, and countless other cryptocurrency companies. 
We've also witnessed the massive failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, which was also a crypto-centric bank. In the wake of these destabilizing events and their devastating impact on the crypto sector, which lost two-thirds of its market cap, it went from $3 trillion market capitalization to $1 trillion, 1.06 as of this morning. Stablecoins remain a relevant oversight topic, particularly considering that they fall within a subset of cryptocurrency or are intended to be non-volatile digital assets by, by intent and design. As reported by the President's Working Group on Financial Markets in its report on stablecoins, and I will quote, if well designed and appropriately regulated, stablecoins could support faster, more efficient, and more inclusive payment options, close quote. However, the panel also underscored that the stablecoins present a variety of risk factors that are not currently subject to robust regulatory standards and cohesive oversight. To this extent, Chairwoman Waters led our committee's bipartisan investigation last Congress to examine the risks to investors, market integrity, and financial stability associated with stablecoins. We reviewed the technology behind stablecoins, their current use cases, state regulatory structures, and federal oversight gaps. And we also examined the role of stablecoins in promoting financial inclusion, potentially. As we learned last year, stablecoins are a type of current cryptocurrency that issuers assert are pegged to stable reserve assets, such as the U.S. dollar. Issuers claimed that stablecoins serve the purpose of payments with the potential to improve payment infrastructure and increase access to financial services. In reality, however, we know that stablecoins are rarely used for payments, but are instead used to facilitate speculative cryptocurrency trading and investments. Stablecoins also contain structural fragilities that make them, a vulner make them vulnerable to run runs and pose risks to monetary policy, national security, financial stability, and fair competition. It is worth revisiting questions of whether stablecoins are even needed if they are hardly used for the purposes intended. If our goal is to improve our payment system and financial inclusion, we should instead consider advancing public sector options such as the Fed now payment system and a publicly issued digital dollar. Considering these insights, I have trouble understanding why this outdated legislation, which is not cognizant of the recent disasters in the crypto space that has structural flaws, is attached to this hearing. I share concerns about key parts of this with the 14 consumer advocacy groups that sent a letter yesterday expressing concern about the grave risks that stablecoins pose to households and our financial system that concerns are numerous, but I will share a few. For starters, giving states the authority to regulate stable coins allows issuers to easily avoid federal oversight and seek out more permissive states. Additionally, the bill identifies the Federal Reserve as the primary regulator for oversight and provides issuers with the access to Federal Reserve programs, such as the discount window, master accounts, and payment services. These programs are typically limited to banks who are heavily regulated, and that is for good reason. Most importantly, the bill does not address the biggest lessons we've learned in recent months. We've witnessed the risks that can occur when players co-mingle customer funds. This bill does not mention how conflicts of interest will be managed, particularly between issuers and exchanges. I also continue to have concerns about allowing non-bank entities non-bank entities with no regulation to issue bank-like products. If the recent bank runs have taught us anything, it is the danger of allowing shadow banking products, particularly stable coins, to issue deposits like products without FDI insurance. So I strongly believe we need to separate crypto assets from our banking system, and this bill does just the opposite. Uh, with that, I, I ask that we Take the time that we need to get this right rather than try to get this first. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the chair of the full committee for one minute. Uh, payment stable coins are an important part of the digital asset ecosystem and have the potential to be a cornerstone of a modern payment system. Uh, I want to thank the subcommittee chair and ranking member for their engagement on this. I want to thank the ranking member, the former chair of the committee, for her engagement. We spent, uh, the ranking member uh, and I spent a significant amount of time working and our staff's working together with Treasury, with Fed, 
or the Fed with members of our committee, last Congress. And I thought it was important to acknowledge that good work as the foundation of our discussions. And the frame laid out that between these negotiations between Ranking Member Waters and I, last Congress, when she was chair, um, I think it's important that we lay that down for a public airing and understanding of what we negotiated. And this is the continuation of that good work. Uh, but it's the first piece of committee work that we've done uh, in a setting like this. A lot of things have happened since, since this draft. And we want members to engage in this, especially new members of this committee, and have uh, ownership of the legislative product that we will be moving. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Waters for her engagement on this. And I think she and I both will confess that this bill is uh, imperfect to us in many, many ways, uh, to, to each of us in different ways. But I thought it was important to ensure that a Democrat-led committee, uh, and now a Republican-led committee, that we acknowledge the intellectual framework around us having a modern financial regulatory regime um, at, at the federal level. Um, but consumer interest is not served by us not acting. We need to have a federal regulatory regime for stable coins. It is important uh, for us internationally and domestically, and it's very important that, that we have the understanding on a bipartisan basis, the utility and importance of this legislation. And with that, I yield back. Thank the chairman. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee for one minute. Thank you very much, um, Chair Hill and Ranking Member Lynch. And I want to thank all the witnesses for testifying today. Uh, let me start by saying, last Congress, my staff and I worked extensively uh, with then Ranking Member McHenry on legislation to provide a regulatory framework for payment. He's uh, absolutely correct about that. However, um, what did not happen was we did not complete the negotiation so that we can move forward. And unfortunately, a lot of things have happened in between. And of course, in addition to FTX and a lot of other things going on, uh, this bill that we have posted in no way represents any final work. And uh, because so much has happened in between, we needed to get back together in negotiations, but Mr. McHenry uh, alarmed me somewhat when he said that the members uh, of, uh, on his side of the aisle had come up with a whole new bill. And I said to him, well, they come uh, to any negotiations having made up their mind already. And I suggested that if he was going to have a Republican bill, that we would go back to work with a Democratic bill. Then we'll get together and then we'll decide uh, who's going to give, uh, what, um, what we were going to do to work out the differences, et cetera, et cetera. That has not happened. So let me just say, the posted bill in no way recommends the final work on stable coins by negotiations between the two of us. The bill has been posted. The chair wanted to post the bill. Uh, it does not represent any final product of any kind. And so I think we're starting from scratch uh, to deal with stable coin. We must deal with it. We must get a stable coin bill. Uh, I think we can do that, but disregard the bill that has been posted altogether. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I would, my response to that would be we welcome uh, any legislative effort from the minority in this regard in a constructive way and, and on behalf of Republicans, we've just been looking at the September draft led by Mrs. Waters and Mr. McHenry and making our own changes, doing our own due diligence, and that's what this hearing's all about. So we agree that in no way is the bill posted to the hearing the be-all or end-all. I made that clear in my opening statement, and so this really is an opportunity for both sides of the aisle to fully engage with this superb panel uh, and think through the right way to uh, revise of the good work of uh, Waters McHenry last, uh, last fall. Before I call on our panel, I want to wish my colleague Jay Jang a happy birthday today. And uh, I know he wanted to start out uh, his day. There's no, nothing says birthday like a stable coins hearing. Um, today we welcome the testimony of Adrian Harris. Ms. Harris is the superintendent of the New York Department of Financial Services. 
Prior to her service there, she was in the senior roles of both the Treasury Department and the White House. Jesse Austin Campbell joined us. He's an adjunct professor at Columbia Business School where he teaches a class on blockchain markets, infrastructure, as well as serving as a managing partner at Zero Knowledge Consulting. Jake Cervinsky, Mr. Cervinsky is the chief policy officer at the Blockchain Association, a digital asset association based here in Washington, D.C. Dante Despere is the chief strategy officer, head of global policy at Circle, the issuer of USDC, as well as a member of the World Economic Forum's Digital Currency Governance Consortium. And our final witness is Delicia reynolds Han. Ms. reynolds Hands is the Director of Financial Fairness at Consumer Reports. We thank each of you for taking time to be here. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. And without objection, each of your written statements will be made part of our full record. Ms. Harris, you're now recognized for five minutes to give your oral presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, Subcommittee Chair Hill, Subcommittee Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the Subcommittee on Digital Assets, Financial Technology, and Inclusion, and to the hardworking staff. I am Adrian Harris, Superintendent of New York's Department of Financial Services, or DFS. Thank you for inviting me today. Strengthening the nation's regulatory oversight of virtual currency is critical to protecting consumers and ensuring the safety and soundness of institutions. I look forward to sharing with you some key features of the DFS framework and to offering continued assistance as you work to develop a comprehensive national regulatory framework. DFS has been a prudential regulator of virtual currency since 2015. Our virtual currency regulatory framework is the most comprehensive in the country, built on the model of full scope banking supervision, but tailored for the unique considerations of the industry. It has served well to protect New York consumers, keep virtual currency entities safe and sound, and hold bad actors to account. The department has a wide range of tools to regulate the virtual currency industry, including licensing, supervision, examination, and enforcement. The core provisions of the DFS regulatory and supervisory framework are robust capital and financial standards, strong consumer protections, sophisticated cybersecurity requirements, and strong anti-money laundering provisions. For example, virtual currency entities are subject to custody and capital requirements designed for industry-specific risks. Entities must hold the virtual currency in the same type and amount on a one-to-one -one basis that is owed or obligated to a customer. That is distinct from the traditional banking fractional reserve system. Once an entity meets rigorous standards to be licensed or chartered, DFS creates a detailed supervisory agreement that is tailored to each company's risks. Companies must get approval from the department for material changes in business, including for new product offerings and stablecoin issuance. Entities also are subject to ongoing supervision and are regularly examined for compliance with regulations and those supervisory agreements. If through our supervision we find that a regulated entity is not in compliance with our rules, DFS's enforcement division can investigate and take appropriate actions to ensure that companies pay penalties for violations, remediate issues, and return lost funds to customers. Specific to stablecoins, DFS was the first agency to provide regulatory clarity for these products. In June 2022, DFS provided guidance related to the issuance of US dollar-backed stablecoins. The DFS stablecoin guidance requires one-to-one -one reserving with cash or cash equivalents, redemption fulfillment within two business days, and public independent audits to confirm reserves. As members of this committee contemplate federal legislation for stablecoins, I believe the best path forward is to build on the well-established dual banking regulatory system. Any legislation that preempts the state's ability to regulate innovative financial services would be harmful to valuable regimes that already exist and hamper state regulators' ability to respond nimbly to a changing financial ecosystem. I am proud of the work DFS has done to develop a comprehensive supervisory framework and to foster a well-regulated virtual currency industry in the state. We welcome further collaboration with you to take advantage of our lessons learned and develop a comprehensive national regulatory framework to protect markets, entities, and consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Campbell, you're now recognized for five minutes for your presentation. 
Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, Subcommittee Chair Hill, and Ranking Member Lynch, all the members of the subcommittee and the hardworking staff for the opportunity today. So I want to start with something of an apology, which is to say the debate around stable coins has been incredibly confused. It's probably been harmful to consumers. It's probably been harmful to the nation. One of the problems is with lack of clarity from Congress, many things are called stable coins, which should not be. What we need is clarity to define stable coins so that we understand that stable coins built right are actually not new and are relatively mundane financial instruments. If you look at frameworks that have worked, like the framework from the NYDFS, these things look like conservative banks, maybe government money market funds. These are the sorts of things we know how to address as a financial system. We can regulate them. And I think there are also answers to some of the issues that already exist in our current system, such as state versus federal. I suggest in my testimony for small to medium sized stable coins, they're fine at the state level. When they become very large and systemic, they should probably exist at the federal level. We don't need a $2 million stable coin being regulated by the OCC or the Federal Reserve. It's not an effective use of time, but nobody is suggesting that JP Morgan be only state regulated. So I think there is a way to make these things work. They serve the purpose of money on a blockchain, and that is what is ultimately the real innovation here is the blockchain itself and the opportunities for transaction that that creates. In the current environment, we are failing at making this happen as a country. Our regulation is currently chaos for stable coins. If I am an issuer and I want to create a stable coin, I technically don't know if I'm going to be answering to a state regulator, a federal banking regulator, the SEC, the CFTC, and it puts you in the same position as if you were out with friends and you were going to play you know, some sports game and somebody tells you, well, we may enforce the rules of baseball or football or basketball and we're not gonna tell you which in advance and maybe some of them will all apply at the same time. It's unworkable. And what this means, and it pains me to say this as an American, is that things are moving offshore. I can say this with certainty because I advise my clients right now to do exactly that. There are other regimes with significantly more regulatory clarity than what we have provided here, where if you are a good actor who wants to comply with the law, who wants to do the right thing, you want to go there because you know you can do it with certainty. And this, it's bad for jobs. It's bad for the strength of the dollar. It's bad for our status as a reserve currency. It's particularly bad for national security, as blockchains have a significant degree of transparency that's not present in markets like actual cash markets, right? When somebody transacts on a blockchain, it's public. We may not always know right now who transacted, but you know the amount, the time, the wallets they traded with, what they sent back and forth. And with the richness of data, it's just a matter of time until you can identify the wallets. This is a huge data analysis tool to enforce our rules on the financial system that we are potentially giving away. Right now, over the past year, the biggest winner has been Tether. They are offshore. They don't work well with us. They facilitate some activity they probably shouldn't. But the chaos is leading that stable coin to grow while others shrink. The other thing that's happening is other countries are moving into this space. Just this morning before the hearing, I saw news that Russia is exploring legislation to formalize their ability to transact in crypto. If we don't take the field, others will do so before us, and they may not be doing it in ways that we like. So in the end, this matters. I would call upon the subcommittee to think deeply about passing some sort of bill about stable coins. We can't let perfect be the enemy of good when one of our enemies here is time. Right now, doing this right will bring financial inclusion through the dollar to billions of people globally. This is not just a US concern, and it reinforces the strength of the dollar in the world. It will help us fund the deficit. Every dollar that goes into stable coins ends up in traditional financial instruments that we can use to fund our government, like T-bills. It will bolster our reserve currency status, and it will ensure that if the blockchain continues to grow at the pace it has from 2012 to present, the standard of transaction on there for a currency is the dollar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Mr. Savinsky, you're now recognized for five minutes for your oral presentation. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hill and Ranking Member Lynch, Chairman McHenry and Ranking Member Waters, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today. 
My name is Jake Trevinsky, and I am Chief Policy Officer for the Blockchain Association, a nonprofit trade association dedicated to advancing good policy so that all the benefits of public blockchains can be realized here in the United States. The Blockchain Association includes over 100 leading US companies who are committed to responsible innovation, to advancing and strengthening the United States strategic position in global finance and technology, and to making financial services more accessible to American consumers. My message for you today is simple. Congress must pass stablecoin legislation. Given the right policy, stablecoins can revolutionize the payment system and reinforce the dominance of the US dollar at a time when our foreign adversaries, like China, are seeking to undermine its status as the global reserve currency. In my time this morning, I want to give you three reasons why stablecoin legislation is so necessary. First, our financial system has a problem. It is stuck in the analog era of the last century, constrained by intermediaries who act as gatekeepers and middlemen to outdated infrastructure that has failed to keep pace with the digital age. Stable, excuse me. Um, today, the global economy is on all the time. It is always connected, and yet our payment system is still slow, it is inefficient, unreliable, and inaccessible to many Americans. Now, public blockchains are the solution to that problem, a revolutionary upgrade on the technology that powers the global financial system. And US dollar stablecoins are one of their best applications, allowing anyone with an internet connection to send any number of dollars to anywhere in the world nearly instantly and at nearly zero cost. Stablecoins outperform legacy payment rails across the board. They are safer, they are faster, they are cheaper, they are more reliable, and they are accessible to everyone. Now, new legislation is necessary to maximize the benefits of stablecoins and also to protect consumers and to ensure that the financial system is safe and sound. Second, the status of the US dollar as the global reserve currency is under threat by foreign adversaries like China, which is pushing the digital yuan as a competitor to the dollar. The best way for us to maintain US dollar dominance worldwide is to spread stable coins all over the world. Stablecoins are indeed best suited to perform that task. Third, if Congress fails to act, we will not only forfeit a huge competitive advantage to our adversaries, we will also lose entrepreneurs and innovators to other more welcoming jurisdictions like Europe, the United Kingdom, Singapore, Japan, Australia, and many others that are far ahead of the United States in regulating digital assets. Make no mistake, regulatory uncertainty is already driving innovation overseas. Adopting stablecoin legislation now will send an important message to the job creators and the taxpayers in the US blockchain industry that they are still welcome here at home. Members of the subcommittee, stablecoin legislation has already received bipartisan, bicameral support. And the Financial Services Committee has already made great strides toward a balanced and effective bill. I urge you to continue that work on a bipartisan basis. And I, along with the Blockchain Association and all of our member companies, stand ready and willing to help. I appreciate the chance to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Desparta, you're now recognized for five minutes for your oral statement. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Mem Member Waters, Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, members of the Subcommittee on Digital Assets, Financial Technology, and Inclusion. 
It is my honor to submit my testimony to you today. My name is Dante Desparte, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy for Circle, a leading global financial technology firm and the issuer of USD Coin, or USDC. USDC is a dollar digital currency supporting the extensibility of the US dollar in a competitive, always-on, internet-based global economy. Indeed, as fears grow of de-dollarization or the rise of alternative payment systems that are non-conversant with US values or broader norms in the rules-based financial system, Circle, USDC, and dollar-denominated payment stablecoins can help to ensure the dollar remains the global currency of reference, including natively on the internet. Over the course of our 10 years of activity in the US and around the world, we have always aspired to a regulation-first approach based on trust, transparency, accountability, and financial integrity. It has been five years since the first USDC was issued, which for the purposes of this hearing and proposed legislation can be considered dollar-denominated payment stablecoin. Today, USDC has supported more than $10 trillion in cumulative transactions on the public internet. USDC-enabled wallets support a global payment network in more than 190 countries, which is akin to a mobile money network like M-Pesa, but at world scale. More than 75% of all USDC in circulation are held in digital wallets and smart contracts, rather than on digital asset exchanges, suggesting a strong correlation as a dollar-denominated store of value. Indeed, there is a Cambrian explosion of use cases and responsible innovation courtesy of the programmable, composable, trusted, and open nature of USDC. Rather than disrupting traditional financial systems or markets, we are seeing growing acceptance of USDC as a dollar settlement option among major financial services firms from Visa, MoneyGram, WorldPay, among many others. By every measure, courtesy of this early adoption of dollars as the currency of reference in digital assets markets, more than 132 billion of stablecoins in circulation reference the dollar, albeit to varying degrees of prudential regulatory standards. While some of these dollar reference stablecoins are starting to embrace sunlight and transparency, USDC was born in it. From the first issuance through to today, we have adopted macroprudential risk standards and transparency that is a hallmark of trust, even when compared to traditional financial services firms. As a result, a proliferation of enterprise use cases and adoption has followed. Enterprise use cases for USDC run the gamut from treasury management to easing the exacting cost and slow speeds of cross-border payments, which remain stubbornly high, inconveniently slow, with little meaningful competition. Indeed, one of the partnerships we are proudest of it shows the art of the possible with USDC and the advantages of open, interoperable payment systems. Last year, Circle, together with the Stellar Development Foundation and MoneyGram, partnered with United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, to enable USDC as a form of digital dollar cash assistance supporting war-displaced Ukrainian refugees. As a sole issuer of USDC, Circle has always operated under the highest prevailing regulatory standards for electronic stored value and money transmission in the US. While other countries regulate payments and electronic money activity at a national level, the US framework empowers state banking and money transmission supervisors to foster, develop, and regulate the payments industry at the state level. Although this sum of the parts approach may be subject to potential operating and regulatory gaps, it has nonetheless produced an economic development model that has enabled companies to start up and scale across the US. Our states are not only the laboratories of US democracy, and crucibles for economic development, they're also the laboratories of payment services innovation. Rather than framing financial innovation and regulation as competing forces, Circle's operating experience over the last decade has prioritized public-private regulatory partnership and personhood. In short, financial innovation, inclusion, and protecting the integrity of the financial system are not competing objectives. Today, we are comprehensively licensed as a state supervised money transmission and electronic stored value company across 48 states. We were the first company to receive a BIT license from the New York State Department of Financial Services in 2015. We have been and remain a registered money services business, conforming with FinCEN's guidance on combating illicit financial activity. The net result is a company that went from a mere idea 10 years ago to a business that has approximately 1,000 employees in 35 states and 12 countries with both strong prospects and desires to become a US-listed company. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to addressing the committee's questions. 
Thank you, sir. Ms. Reynolds Hand, you're now recognized for five minutes for your oral presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, Subcommittee Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to participate in this important conversation about stable coins and the need for legislation today. My name is Delicia Reynolds Hand, and I'm the Director of Financial Fairness at Consumer Reports, where I lead the organization's work to evaluate and rate digital financial products and services. Today, these products and services promise all kinds of things, financial security, well-being, and even the ability to leverage new forms of asset classes without financial intermediaries with a simple swipe or click. Whether these products and services live up to these promises is still an open question, but one that we aim to answer through our product testing and consumer research. Cryptocurrencies can be appealing to everyday consumers whom traditional finance has never appropriately served. Our own 2022 Consumer Reports survey showed that African Americans once owned cryptocurrencies at a higher rate than other ethnic groups. These consumers have never been a priority of the traditional finance and banking system. They continue to live, however, in credit and intergenerational wealth deserts. So there's a certain appeal to something outside the very financial system, which has largely ignored them. They're the targets of Super Bowl ads, influencers, and cryptocurrency kiosks. But consumers are caught in a vicious cycle of boom and bust of crypto experimentation. It is a public policy disaster that there are yet no uniform and meaningful regulatory frameworks in the US. These risks are significant and include an unlimited supply of tokens and coins ser serving as collateral for loans, rigid self-executing smart contracts, non-existent reserve requirements, lack of interoperability requirements, lack of meaningful disclosures, and the creation of debtor-creditor relationships. We need to see common sense, consumer-first, comprehensive regulation. And the bill is posted, while it does have some positive things, does create some concern. The bill creates the potential for regulatory arbitrage. An important check on our banking system is even state chartered institutions have to obtain federal approval. But this bill has no equivalent requirements for federal regulatory review as the Federal Reserve Board or other regulators would have no authority to reject state licensing. Second, while the bill does, important, does outline an important role for federal oversight, and require parent companies um, of bank subsidiaries authorized as stablecoin issuers to be insured depository institutions doesn't provide the same requirement for non-bank issuers. And allowing this will create confusion and less protection for consumers that choose to purchase stablecoins that do not offer such insurance. While the bill sets up a regime to approve issuers of payment stablecoin, it does Excuse me, but could you, you mind bringing your microphone a little closer, please? Sure. Oh, thank you. Apologies. While the bill sets up a regime to approve issuers of payment stable coins, it doesn't outline how payment activities conducted or facilitated by the issuers or their coins will have adequate consumer protections. Consumers need to be able to prevent, cancel, replace, or override a transaction, and this is a critical critical function necessary to ensure payment system operators are able to conduct chargebacks or facilitate disputes over payments. Consumers have come to rely on interoperability, and additionally, they should have the same benefits in stablecoin payments, but this bill does not require interoperable technology protocol, though the bill calls for the development of standards. This may still impede consumer access and leave consumers walled off into each institution's specific system. Related, we'd like to see additional language associated with custodial wallets. While custodial wallets may help consumers keep track of their keys, this has created a legal gray area that should be clarified. The law should prevent a debtor-creditor relationship from being formed, and this should be clearly required in the disclosures. There are additional consumer investor protections that we would like to see included or improved in the bill, such as moving from outdated notice and disclosures, prohibiting the commingling of funds, requiring a 24-hour calendar day redemption requirement, 
and ensuring a consumer's use of stablecoin does not create the debtor-creditor relationship. Notably, we want to see all federal regulators have a clear and meaningful role in this space. I encourage committee members to continue to work together on a bipartisan basis, and I appreciate the ability to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll now turn to member questions, and the chair recognizes uh, himself for five minutes of, of questions. Currently, the SEC and the CFTC are taking contradictory positions in court about whether one of the most utilized stable coins in the market is a security or a commodity. This creates an impossible situation for the private sector, for other regulators, stable coin issuers who can't possibly comply with both uh, securities and commodities laws at the same time. One of the main goals of our legislation is to resolve this regulatory uncertainty once and for all. Let me start with you, uh, Mr. Desparte. Can you discuss the impact of that conflict? Thank you, Chairman Hill. Indeed, this, uh, what I like to classify as sort of a regulatory Game of Thrones at the federal level, isn't helpful. Um, I think we saw that yesterday in the committee uh, looking at securities issues alone. It isn't particularly helpful. There is a proliferation of digital assets in circulation. However, virtually every country in the world uh, of substance treats payment stable coins under an equivalent national regime that would conform with electronic money rules and as a payments and banking innovation, not a securities or commodities innovation. They might be used in digital asset trading, but their core function, particularly when treated as a payment stable coin, is to solve the buyer's and spender's remorse uh, that were one of the original sins, if you will, of the digital assets industry. Thank you. Um, Mr. Campbell, in your view, should non-interest bearing payment stable coins be considered securities? No, I would echo Dante's comments. These fundamentally work like money. They operate like banking products, unless you believe that something like JP Morgan's bank deposits or physical U.S. dollars should be securities, then these should not be either, and they should okay. work that way. That's helpful. Let me switch gears. The current regulatory framework for stable coins is mostly handled by state regulators and FinCEN. These straight state frameworks, New York being the most recognizable, provide critical consumer protections and regulatory oversight. As we seek to set up a federal framework, it's critical that we also retain multiple pathways for payment stablecoin issuers. This is an aspect of the proposal that I particularly want to make sure we get right. We had a version of that in the draft. So, Superintendent Harris, would you describe what role you think state regulators currently play, should play, in regulating payment stablecoin issuers? Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I think the state regulators can play an incredibly important role, as you've seen in New York. Uh, we work very closely with, with FinCEN, among other federal regulators, but we have been able to nimbly respond to all changes in the, the marketplace, laying out a flexible licensing and charter regime, both through our bit license and limited purpose trust, engaging in supervisory agreements with each of our licensed entities so that we can tailor our oversight uh, to each of the risks that those entities present, examining on a regular basis and bringing enforcement actions when necessary. And as I noted in my testimony, everything that we do is based on banking supervision model. And I think it would be very helpful to see the dual regulatory framework that we use in banking duplicated for cryptocurrency and stable coins as well. Good. Thank you. And consumer protections at the forefront of what you do and investors, right? Absolutely. We I thought uh, Ms. Uh, you know, Reynolds Hand made good points about making sure that's at the forefront of what we're doing, and you would echo that as a state regulator? Absolutely. We require robust disclosures about fees and, and risks. Uh, we require one-to-one -one reserving and mm -hmm. attestations. We don't allow lending of consumer assets. We require segregation, all of which are very important consumer protections. Thank you. So Mr. Himes is uh, visiting with our subcommittee today. We're glad to have you, Mr. Himes. And he and I have a bill called the 21st Century Dollar Act. The mission is to ask the Treasury to inform Congress about how to keep the preeminence of the dollar, the dollar-based trading system in the world, which is integral to the economic success of the U.S. and has been a boon for countries all over the world in the past eight decades. It's a positive thing, not a negative thing, and only people who think it's negative are people we're sanctioning. So you have to think about that for a little bit. We're not here to emulate whatever the surveillance state policies are of Iran or China. 
Uh, one of the benefits of creating regulatory certain, in my view, in America is preserving this innovation in our country and preserving the U.S. dollar status as the global reserve currency. Mr. Desparte, could you reflect on the role stable coins can play in supporting U.S. dollar dominance? Uh, thank you, Chairman. As I had mentioned in my testimony, cumulatively in five years alone, Circle's USDC has processed $10 trillion of internet native payments. This is an activity that is not possible by any other means and any other transactions. Most of the world's payment systems labor under what is known as the walled garden problem. That would be the equivalent of a Gmail account not being able to send an email to a Hotmail account because the two systems are not conversant. Thank you very much. If further thoughts from members on, on of the panel, please respond in writing. And I'd like to turn to my friend, the ranking member, for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Hand, the, the landscape of stable coins has changed considerably in recent months. Uh, in particular, it's shrunk uh, due to failure of some stable coin issuers following the collapse of FTX, uh, the crypto exchange. Uh, about a million customers lost all their money, uh, totaling about $8.9 billion. Uh, all of this has has revealed some complex risks associated with stable coins, including their lack of stable values. Uh, stable coins are not stable, obviously. Uh, the exposure that, that some of these non-bank uh, uh, products uh, expose the banking system. I know that uh, there have been uh, warnings to the banking system about uh, the custody the custody of uh, stable coins and, and dealing with other cryptocurrencies and also uh, the vulnerability to runs that we've seen recently uh, can you talk about some of the other risks that have been exposed in recent months and could you also discuss the ways in which the current legislation uh, that is tied to this hearing does not reflect uh, those vulnerabilities and uh, does not offer ways to address those new risks? Certainly. Um, thank you for the question. So um, I think one of the primary risks has actually been brought up in testimony here today with reference to the growing acceptance of USDC by financial institutions. So despite recent instability and volatility that has impacted the fiat currency banking system, um, we continue to see um, industry, uh, traditional financial industry invest. Um, and this is at the risk of um, consumers. Um, what we need to see in a bill is clear activity limitations um, that, that reflect some of the issues that came up in recent months. Um, we need to see um, limitations on commingling. That was an issue uh, with FTX. Um, we also need to see restrictions on self-dealing, um, undisclosed conflict of interest, um, and very explicitly for the consumers in Celsius um, who were um, not able to recover, we need to prevent a debtor-creditor a debtor relationship um, so that my coins are my coins um, and not those of the company. So those are some of the key risks um, that we see not address, um, among other things. I do want to uh, make one correction in what I said before. I think I, I talked about uh, Tether's collapse. It's actually Terra, not Tether, that, that, that collapsed. Uh, Tether just dropped in value. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, one of the things I worry about this, in this current legislation uh, being proposed is that it would allow stablecoin issuers uh, access to the Federal Reserve Services, the discount window. One, one of the one of the saving graces of the FTS collapse and other subsequent collapses is that it wasn't tied to the traditional uh, banking system. And so it, it, it was, uh, we had ring fenced uh, the crypto industry. So all those losses were, well, most of those losses were, were occurring in the, uh, the crypto industry itself and did not infect uh, the traditional banking system, which is uh, the envy of the world and uh, you know, provides so much uh, 
know, power to uh, the U.S. dollar and provides a, a safe haven for much global investment. Um, can you discuss the risks that can come with allowing stablecoin issuers to act like banks without, without the regulatory framework that, that uh, it provides protection to depositors and uh, provides integrity to our entire system? Certainly. I'll start with a historical point, which is the reason why we have the National Bank Act stem from a series of bank failures and systemic runs and a complete lack of federal oversight. So in the equivalent um, here, we, we need that clarity. We cannot treat non-bank entities like banks without the equivalent um, restrictions to their access to consumers and um, not having substantive consumer protections in place. My time has expired. I, I yield back. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentlewoman, the ranking member of the committee, for five minutes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got that backwards. Uh, Mr. Lucas of Oklahoma for five minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, I think it's helpful as we work through this process to do just a little bit of uh, housekeeping on some of the definitions. Uh, Stablecoin attempts to provide a relatively stable value when pegged, when pegging its value to real world assets. Mr. Campbell, could you elaborate on the different categories of underlying assets that can back a stable coin? And then specifically on the payment stable coins in the legislation we're discussing today? Yes, thank you very much. So if we look out in the wild, there's really three kinds of stable coins that have existed. One I would call fiat-backed stable coins. They kind of work the way you have in your mind, which is there's a pile of some sort of financial instruments behind them. The second is crypto-backed. This is people attempting to over-collateralize with things like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And then the last version is algorithmic, which are backed by some sort of mathematical relationship. I would tell you the first category has been largely successful. The second two are highly experimental financial products that probably should not be called stable. And I would say specifically within this bill, defining stable coins as the first category with good reserve guidelines and then consumer protections around what you are allowed to call a stable coin would be greatly helpful. Thank you. Ms. Harris, you discussed the general approval process for a bit license through the New York State Department of Financial Services and how DFS enters into supervisory agreements with companies based on their individual risks and business models. Could you elaborate a bit more on examples of specific risks presented by a firm that could be addressed in a supervisory agreement? Absolutely, thank you, sir. Uh, first, I wanna note we have two licensing or one licensing and one chartering regime in New York, so it gives companies the flexibility to choose a regime that matches their business model without sacrificing any regulatory rigor. Then once a firm has a license or a charter, as you noted, we engage in the negotiation of a supervisory agreement that allows us to tailor our oversight to risk. So imagine a company uh, that wants to offer a coin on two different protocols. We can require separate disclosures, enhance cybersecurity controls, enhance BSA AML controls based on the risks that those protocols uh, might present. We also have pre-approval for every new product or material change in business a licensee seeks to offer. Mr. Desparte, Circle's USD coin fell below its $1 peg during the banking turmoil that stemmed from Silicon Valley Bank. SVB was, of course, one of the banks that Circle used to manage cash reserves, and as we all know, the depositors stepped in to, regulators, I should say, stepped in to fully insure those deposits. Uh, Mr. Desparte, could you discuss the lessons learned from the collapse of SVB? and what the potential impact of the SVB collapse was to uh, USDC? Thank you for the question, uh, Congressman. The uh, one, we learned a lot of lessons. The first of which is that while many of the policy conversations have been about what risks could crypto and digital assets introduce to the traditional banking system and the traditional sector, what we learned with the failure of not one bank, but three successive bank failures uh, consecutively over the course of uh, several weeks, was that we had to protect our business from risks in banking. 
One of those risks obviously could have been an existential level event uh, for America's commercial banks, but for the federal intervention. And over the course of the weekend, uh, Circle, like any other US regulated money transmitter, has a fiduciary obligation to redeem all USDC demands at par. And we were able to ma make that promise on the Saturday after the bank failures began, um, closing the temporary DPEG of USDC from 88 cents to 98 cents. Um, and then today, I think as we, as we advocate for this legislation, one of, the, one of the points that we could separate is payments activity from banking. Uh, because Circle, like any other company, uh, that relies on banks for payments had an exposure, and that exposure was what happens with uninsured deposits inside the banking system. Absolutely. Uh, I thank the witnesses for their observations. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Oklahoma. And now the distinguished uh, gentlewoman from California, the ranking member of the full committee, Mrs. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I want to understand uh, Superintendent Harris is present here today. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. I didn't know that you have a regulatory framework for stable coins, do you? Yes, ma'am, we do. Quite a robust one that exists both in regulation, in our supervisory agreements, and in our recent guidance that we issued. Well, even though I agree with most of our panel uh, that we should move uh, very quickly to establish a stable coin bill and get that legislation going. I agree with that. But uh, since I have you here, Ms. Harris, I cannot help but ask you a few questions about um, the uh, stable coins um, that we are concerned about, certainly are very important. But you just had a big bank failure in New York. And I want to take a, a moment or so to understand that uh, what happened uh, with uh, the, one of the biggest bank, biggest bank failures in the country as it relates to cryptocurrency, if I may. Absolutely, ma'am. It is a misnomer that the failure of Signature Bank was related to crypto. What we saw with Signature Bank is that it had a new-fashioned bank run, and the outflow of deposits uh, were from a broad depositor base, including wholesale food vendors, uh, fiduciaries, trust accounts, law firms, and in fact, the outflow of crypto deposits were in exact proportion to their representation in the depositor base overall. Uh, and in fact, some of those deposit outflows were actually pre-planned. So it's, of course, unfortunate that there was a run on the bank in, at Signature prompted by what we saw with, with SVB. Um, but it is not the case that the failure of Signature was related to crypto. Uh, again, um, why is it... Um understood or believed uh, that it was certainly related to cryptocurrency. How do you absolutely excuse cryptocurrency from being a part of the problem of signature that caused it um, uh, to be in the situation that it was, that it had to be closed down? Yes, ma'am. I think uh, it is part of what has transpired with social media and other things. It is true that signature banked uh, a healthy proportion of crypto customers, about 20% of its depositor base was crypto com uh, companies. They were known and had announced previously that they were de-risking from the crypto space. But again, with the run we saw on the bank that Friday evening, about 20% of the deposits left the bank, but 20% of that 20% was crypto. The rest were normal commercial customers with uninsured deposits that were leaving the bank. And so we did not see the collapse as a result of crypto deposits and their instability there. It was a broad base of depositors that left the bank. The crypto depositors that left the bank were in exact proportion to their depositor base. Uh, and so it really was just a, a new fashion bank run prompted by what happened with SVB. Well, um, there will be continued, uh, as you know, discussions and Absolutely. hearings, et cetera, investigations going on at the issue. But since you do have a regulatory uh, regime here for um, uh, the um, stable coin, much of the concern that we have, you know, learned about has to do with assets and whether or not they're credible and what can be called an asset and how can we be sure that we're going to protect the investors uh, with assets that may not be real. What have you learned about that? 
Well, we've learned a great deal, and let me start by saying, in New York, we did not license FTX. They could not do business in New York. The same is true of Voyager, and the same is true of Celsius. They did not meet our standards, and so they could not operate in New York, even though they could operate in the rest of the country. We require our stablecoin issuers to back their stablecoins one-to-one with cash and cash equivalents. They have to provide redemption to their customers within two business days. They have to provide public and independent attestations of their reserve mix on their websites. And we have robust capital requirements based on uh, a very sophisticated formula that we require our companies to have, which is why no New York licensed entity has gone bankrupt. And so what would you advise us since we're still at the point of uh, putting together legislation and hopefully working uh, in a bipartisan way to do that what um, advice can you give us about determining what is and what is not an asset, a real asset? I think, ma'am, the framework that we've put together uh, in New York is a, is a very good model that has served well to protect New Yorkers, and I would urge the committee to do what it can to, to duplicate that and allow for a state pathway so that nimble regulators can continue to police the space appropriately. Thank you very much, and there's another question, and I think I'll, uh, Ask Ms. Reynolds this, this question. Uh, Ms. Reynolds' uh, hand. What do you think, given the implications of our national payment system, should we allow states to regulate payment stablecoins on their own? Uh, does a federal agency like the Fed need a role to approve payment stablecoins before they are issued in addition to regulating them and digital wallet providers? Could you submit that answer in writing? Yes, happy to do so. The gentlewoman's time has expired. Thank you. The gentleman recognizes Mr. Davidson, the vice chair of this subcommittee and the chair of the Housing and Insurance Subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks for our witnesses for being here today. Uh, I thank you know, the staff on both sides of the aisle for all the work that's gone into getting to this point on stablecoin bill. And the market has been pleading for this for a long time, except in New York. So uh, the New York uh, regulators have been way ahead of the curve. I'm glad that more of my colleagues are learning. <clears throat> um, not only is there a regulatory framework in place, but that it's essentially impossible for a stable coin to go to zero. And the reason is it's backed by level one high quality liquid assets, or in at least one case, uh, physical custody of a commodity. Not a derivatives contract, like a net asset value fund, but actual audited, physically present custody of a commodity. So um, you know, Superintendent Harris, uh, you know, you regulate those things. So what would you say are the key elements of the guidance that gives people confidence that a stable coin really is stable uh, and backed by the full value, whether that's a dollar or in the case of a commodity, the value of the commodity? Thank you so much for your, for your question, sir. They are precisely the, the elements that you mentioned, and I'll also note that in New York, we have not approved any algorithmically backed uh, stable coins for issuance or listing in New York. But it is that that one-to-one -one backing. Uh, it is our prohibition on commingling, rehypothecation, lending. It is our T plus two redemption, and it is our, our audit and reporting requirements, I think, that give consumers quite a bit of confidence in a New York-regulated entity. Um, just as a follow-up, when you, when you look at the implications of that, I, I'm from Ohio. Um, you know, we don't have an Ohio regulator that's doing what you're doing, but a federal framework for payment stable coins would say, yeah, we could trust that the New York financial service regulators got this. At some level, we would have some federal supervision that would interact like we do in other financial services, and that would be highly compatible with your existing state-based regulatory framework? Absolutely, sir. Thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, Mr. Campbell, Tether is the largest stablecoin in the ecosystem, and it's headquartered in Hong Kong. What does that mean for the stablecoin ecosystem that Tether is located offshore, uh, and you know how has Tether become such a large player in the space? Yeah, thank you for the question. I would say, one, Tether has become a large player because they had a first mover advantage. They started in 2014 before other stable coins, and that just speaks to the problem of inaction when people can't move elsewhere. You end up with entrenched incumbents. Two, Tether has not faced the same kind of regulatory uncertainty. They don't have the concerns that others do about having to conform with something relatively strict and relatively demanding like the NYDFS guidance, which by the way, I greatly support having worked in that space as well. 
That keeps consumers safe. They're not transparent. It's unclear if they've always had all the reserves, and it puts people at risk. But when they are the default option because others are being hamstrung, it's what people use because there's demand for dollars on a blockchain. And so I think it's there just because it's been available. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And uh, thanks for your clarification. I, I guess I would say I've felt at times that because they don't have the transparency and disclosure requirements, uh, at, I've at times referred to it as a time bomb because we have clarity in New York, but we don't have clarity into Hong Kong's market. And frankly, the move to Hong Kong is a step in the right direction because for a while it wasn't even clear that they were accountable even in Hong Kong. Uh, so, you know, hopefully Tether's uh, stable uh, as purported to be, but I think the real opportunity for us is for this body uh, to, to create legal clarity. And look, we, we hit, um, you know, Chairman Gensler pretty hard yesterday uh, on, on his failure at the SEC to provide clarity, but ultimately we should be clear, the job to provide legal clarity at the federal level is right here in this body. And I just want to thank, uh, you know, Chairman McHenry and uh, you know, when she was chairwoman, Maxine Waters, for paying attention to this space. The market really needs this legal clarity, and I think that's something that both of you have highlighted. But um, let me close with uh, Mr. Travinsky. If stable coins are to eventually be used as an actual medium of exchange uh, to move that store of value that is stable, do you believe it's necessar necessary that they retain the attributes of cash which is, you know, permissionless peer-to-peer -peer transactions versus a, an intermediary third party that facilitates the transactions. Thank you for your question, Congressman. I think that's absolutely critical. I think that we are currently moving toward a cashless society, and we can go one of two directions. We can either follow China and have a currency that is totally controlled and surveilled by government and also by corporations to serve a business model of surveillance capitalism, or we can reproduce the benefits of cash. I think we all agree that cash is a very important tool for people to use, and we can do that in the digital space using stable coins. Yeah, Gentlemen, it's time to be expired. trusted. It has to have those characteristics. My time's expired, and I yield. Thank you, the gentleman for lend, uh, yielding, and now my, my friend from Illinois, the distinguished ranking member of the Subcommittee on Financial Institutions, Dr. Foster, for five minutes. I, I guess I'll start with a question that I asked in a little more than a year ago when we had SBF and all the crypto luminaries in front of our committee. Um, and what I regard the foundational question on, on identity, which is if we wish to prevent crypto assets from being used for ransomware and a long list of illicit activities, is there any alternative to having every crypto transaction traceable to uh, the secure digital identity of a, um, issued by a country with which we have extradition treaties? Or is there any, any technological solution to that that anyone is aware of? Or do we have to just say we cannot have self-custody, we can't have any of these, we can't have anonymous transactions? Um, and so is there anyone that believes there's a solution that prevents ransomware that doesn't, uh, you know, that doesn't violate that? Um, I'll take that, Congressman. I think that there will be those solutions, and I can tell no, you- No, that's not acceptable. You're talking about doing something right now. Right now, is there a technology that stops ransomware if we allow anonymous, you know, self-custody on anonymous transactions? There are many companies working on very important- And technology. that do not have solutions that work. I understand there are many companies that are like, you know, or, or anonymous Monero type collaborations that are trying to make the exact opposite happen. So that I think from, and so I think that everyone should, list, watching this debate should understand that either you support continuation of ransomware and all that illicit stuff, or you don't. And it's a pretty much binary solution, a binary choice that we have to face. I believe that the, that the people of the United States do not want to live in a world where anonymous transactions Another example of, of this, let's say that someone you know, pulls a, you know, puts a gun at your head, drags you into an alley, says, get out your phone and transfer all of your digital assets to me, okay? Are you screwed or not, all right? In, in your ideal world, um, are you in your utopia? What is your reaction to that? So I will say, if you look at the models of existing stable coins, including the Paxos stable coins that I previously ran, we do have a solution to this problem, and I advocate for it in my testimony. Stable coins that exist on public blockchains should have freeze and seize capabilities. If there's illicit action, we need the ability to take those coins back and prevent them from being spent. 
We also need blockchain surveillance tools, which Superintendent Harris talked about. They exist: Chainalysis, Elliptic, Inca Digital. Yeah, and but these are being defeated. These assets. are being defeated by more anonymous uh, coins on, all the time. Only when using crypto assets that are not the regulated stable. Coins. All right. So that part of what your activity. vision is is that there be mandatory transparency, so that ultimately regulators can see the true, the true identities behind. Uh, behind the participants that, in transactions. That's one option. I would say the other is right now, given the lack of clarity and inability of many of the most regulated financial institutions to operate in this space, you have many bad actors. If you create a federal pathway where they use specifically regulated stable coins that have these properties, right. our yeah. interdiction. So what ultimately what we need is a the equivalent of a license plate on every digital wallet. Because if you think about how essential the development of license plates and driver's license were to the healthy development of the automobile industry, you know, this was crucial. It would be completely unacceptable to have unlicensed cars and unlicensed drivers driving through your neighborhood or across your international borders. And so what we need is a, you know, it can be anonymous like a license plate is anonymous under most circumstances, but you have to have that guarantee that when someone drives through your neighborhood, drive, runs over your dog, that you can jot down the license plate, take it to a trusted court system, de-anonymize the owner of that car or that wallet, and you know, haul them into court. I would say, in fact, in the freeze and seize regimes for stable coins, you don't even need anything other than their license plate. I don't need to know who owns a wallet address to take the assets out of it. If somebody was hacked, and all we know is the wallet address, you could take those assets back. Uh, the, you have to know the private key associated with it. No, no, with the freeze. Oh, if you if you have or if you're willing to, standard, okay, we can take it back with some kind of governance um, superseding and overpowering the blockchain. In which case, the blockchain doesn't rule. You have a trusted third party that can reverse transactions. That right. that is essentially correct in how the centralized yeah, okay. fiat stablecoin issuers. Right, let's see. In the, the just all right for the last thirty seconds here. You know, there's a whole bundle of things associated with rapid run risk, fraudulent minting, implications on monetary policy that all seem like they would be perfectly addressed with a simple rule that any stable coin that's issued has to be associated with an account at the Federal Reserve and that no issuance is valid until it's accompanied by an attestation from the Fed that the total amount that's been issued is, um, is less than what's on reserve at the Fed. And a simple API that the Fed would provide, as well as a license, seems like it answers that whole bundle of things. Is there anyone, if you can answer for the record if you see any problems with that simple rule, um, among other things, it provides a business model for issuers because they get to collect the interest from the Fed. I would invite the panel to uh, respond to that good question in writing. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Now uh, yield five minutes to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Desparte, in the last few weeks, $6 billion has been transferred from USDC to foreign stablecoins. That's $6 billion that left the US economy. That's $6 billion that is no longer subject to the same US AML KYC standards. Uh, could you opine on this? What do you believe are the reasons for this mass exodus of U.S. funds, and do you believe it's due to the lack of regulatory clarity, and what implications does that have for our national security? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Um, for one, I, I do think for a lot of users of these alternatives in the world, be it alternative payment systems, or in this case, Tether, um, opacity is the feature they're looking for the most. And, and that should not be conflated nor confused with the presumption of privacy in financial services, whether digital or analog. Uh, but I do think there is a race to the bottom taking place in corners of this market segment. And candidly, the void of regulatory clarity in the United States is partly fueling that vacuum. Um, and then there's also a geopolitical uh, digital currency space race taking place around the world that I think more importantly and perhaps more kinetically in the short run, also manifests itself as a digital assets 5G wars. And so just the same as you, there are certain companies you wouldn't want building hardware and software in your telecommunications infrastructure, I think there are certain firms in this industry that you wouldn't want building the financial plumbing of the future, and many of those firms are operating with impunity outside of the perimeter of major jurisdictions, including the United States. Thank you for that. Um, it seems the direct contradictions from regulators are just one of the many signs that show Congress needs to act. Uh, many stablecoin projects are fleeing the United States for countries that have established clear frameworks for payment stablecoin issuance. The longer the US goes without a clear regulatory framework for stablecoins, the more this will accelerate. Uh, Mr. Travinsky, would you describe what the impact will be if legislation is not enacted? 
Um, thank you for your question. I think if, if Congress doesn't act, then stable coins will be issued in other countries. Uh, there is a clear desire for this type of technology and for its application to national currencies. And there are many other jurisdictions that are adopting workable frameworks. And I think what that means is that the United States will not be able to ensure that stablecoin issuers are observing American principles. It also may mean that stablecoins will not be based on the US dollar to begin with. We'll see euro stablecoins in Europe and yen stablecoins in Japan. And that will be a hit to US dollar dominance and, and something that we should avoid. Thank you. The, the draft legislation attached to this hearing would require stablecoin issuers to produce information such as financial inclusion reports annually. Uh, Mr. Campbell, in your view, what is helpful to know about a stablecoin issuer? Uh, would you consider financial inclusion reporting as materially important enough to be statutorily required? Well, thank you for the question. I would start by saying I primarily think of these as banking products, which means the first thing I think about is safety and soundness. When I think about stable coins, number one on the list when you think about transparency is transparency of reserve assets, composition of reserve assets, and giving everybody from a financial inclusion perspective the faith that they can use this instrument. And it's backed by things like cash at US banks that is insured. It's backed by T-bills. It's backed by the correct forms of assets then where you end up with from an inclusion standpoint is regardless of reporting at very low cost with very low friction, every American and others can use this product. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman from South Carolina yields back. The gentleman from New York is now recognized uh, for five minutes, Mr. Torres. Thank you. Superintendent Harris, I said to you privately and will reiterate publicly that I will not support any stablecoin legislation that preempts the New York State Department of Financial Services or otherwise encroaches on the sovereignty of New York State. As a New Yorker, that is a red line for me. When it comes to finance, there's a long tradition of dual regulation. Just like banking has both a federal option and a state option, stablecoin issuance should have both a federal option and a state option. And a state option should exist not only on paper, but in practice. The federal government should certainly have a floor that prevents regulatory arbitrage to be sure, but there's no need for a ceiling that preempts either in theory or in practice. Does the proposed legislation before us create a genuine system of dual regulation? Thank you so much, Congressman. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you and work with you since taking this role, so I appreciate uh, your partnership. Uh, I think there are improvements that could certainly be made to the present legislation. Although it has language that states nothing in the legislation will preempt states in practice, I think there are a number of provisions that give federal regulators veto authority over state regulators and their judgments and, and oversights that would be counterproductive and provide a disincentive for companies to take a state path. So we're not quite there yet? Not quite yet. Do you agree that stablecoin issuers should be fully reserved and that those reserves should, be, should consist of 100% cash or cash equivalents? Absolutely, and that's what we do in New York. And do you agree that those stablecoin reserves should be verified not only by self-attestation but also by a third-party audit? Yep, and that's what we do in New York. You know, common sense dictates that you cannot have an honor system in which a charlatan like Sam Bankman-Fried claims to be fully reserved and then the regulators take his word for it. Um, exactly. The PWG report proposes banking regulation for stablecoin issuers. But since a stablecoin issuer has no fractionalization of reserves and no lending function like a bank, it would seem to me that a stablecoin issuer operates differently from a bank and therefore should be regulated differently. Mr. Shavinsky, do you agree with that analysis? I completely agree, and I think that we can design reasonable, tailored regulations for non-bank entities to issue stablecoins in a way that is just as safe and sound as a bank doing the same. Um, SEC Chair Gary Gensler asserts that an alternate regulatory framework for crypto would, quote, undermine 90 years of securities law since American federalism has 50 laboratories of democracy, we can actually test that thesis, that hypothesis against the regulatory experience of one of those laboratories, New York State. So in New York State, crypto regulation is segregated from securities regulation. The New York State Department of Financial Services regulates crypto, whereas the New York State Attorney General regulates securities. So has the Gensler hypothesis been proven right or wrong in New York? Has a separate regulatory framework for crypto undercuts securities regulation? So what I would say is 
our authorities do not depend on definitions about what is a security, what is a commodity, what is a currency. At DFS, we have blanket authority over virtual assets, and we exercise it accordingly. Some of our companies are also subject to registration requirements uh, with the AG, and I think what we've done in New York has proved quite successful for some of the reasons we've discussed today. So has a separate licensing regime for crypto come at the expense of regulatory rigor? No, not at all, to the contrary. In fact, New York State DFS is the most rigorous regulator of crypto in the country. And I would say in the world. In fact, which was the first, what state was the first state to raise red flags about the insufficient reserves of Tether? It was not the SEC, it was not the CFTC, it was the state of New York. Correct. And so the notion that a separate regulatory framework for crypto would undermine 90 decades, 90 years of securities law has been definitively disproven in New York State. Um, the, the legacy financial system has high fees and long delays that prey upon the lowest income Americans. Poor people of color have to pay predatory fees in order to transfer their own money to loved ones abroad. Stablecoin has the ability to function as a currency and blockchain has the ability to move money from peer to peer in real time. Mr. Campbell, is it fair to say that the combination of those two technologies have the potential to create a better, cheaper, and faster payment system? That question's for Mr. Campbell and Mr. Disparte. I thank you for the question, and I would say yes unequivocally. The beauty of a blockchain is it treats everybody the same. If you have low fees, high transparency, high ability to transact, everybody can use it regardless of the amount of money they have, and I think that is one of the oh, best yeah. features of this new technological innovation. Unequivocally. Short and sweet. I yield back. The gentleman from New York yields back. The gentlewoman, Ms. Houchins, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hill and Ranking Member Lynch. Thank you to the witnesses for your testimony and for speaking with us today. As I highlighted yesterday in our hearing with SEC Chair Ginsler, I'm concerned about the lack of regulatory, cl regulatory clarity from agencies and the restrictive, overly burdensome approach that many of our federal regulators are taking with the digital assets ecosystem. The constant threat of regulation by enforcement has done nothing to help businesses and innovators here in the U.S. Instead, this unclear approach by the federal agencies has only served to push innovators elsewhere. Mr. Desparte, Circle just announced it's opening its European headquarters in Paris. What does the regulatory environment for stablecoins look like in the EU? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. The uh, European Union since 2019 has embarked on a whole of region, whole of economy framework for digital assets known as the markets and crypto assets framework. Originally, this was in response to fears of big tech and at some level fears of China tech or geopolitical competition and technology. But today, that framework has evolved into perhaps the world's most comprehensive framework for digital assets that including the topic of stable coins would acknowledge them as electronic money tokens and, and would passport those, uh, those licenses across the European Union. Circle has just announced the submission of two licenses in Europe, in Paris, as in France as the venue of choice. One is an electronic money license, and the second is a uh, digital asset service provider license. And the two of them would allow for all of the activity that we support here uh, to, to be effectively exported to Europe. I should add, we've also filed for a, a similar license in Singapore as a major payments institution. So how does it compare to the draft proposal from the 117th Congress that is attached to this hearing? Well, on the one hand, it is a much broader framework. And so the, the European framework, MICA, Markets and Crypto Assets Frameworks, contemplates broader activities than payment stablecoins. Um, it, it contemplates uh, digital asset tradings, which types of assets would be systemic, definitional issues around market conduct, um, and so on. But it does have many aspects that would be comparable. Um, for example, the requirement of prudential treatment of stablecoin reserves, segregation of funds, a lot of the disclosure points that we have highlighted so far in this hearing. And to be clear, the EU is not the only foreign political entity that's moving on this issue. Uh, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Desparte, could you shed some light on what other countries' regulatory frameworks for stablecoins look like and what the frameworks require of issuers? Uh, I'm, I'm looking at what are the implications of the United States not being the first mover in this space and how has that impacted the current dynamics of the overall ecosystem? Well, thank you for that question. I would say 
if you look around the world, you're starting to see legislation that deals specifically with fiat-backed stablecoins. So nobody's really embracing crypto-backed, nobody's really embracing algorithmic, but places like Singapore, like Dubai, like Abu Dhabi, like the UK, who's now working on a framework, like the European Union, all have frameworks that I would say are substantially similar to what has been proposed in the 117th Congress bill. I think we can do better in America. Our financial regulation and systems are more robust than some of those places. But in general, if we don't act, those are the best options and people will take advantage of them. Thank you. And for my part, I don't subscribe to the view that it's a zero-sum proposition. I do think the stakes are increasingly higher and there's more choices in terms of jurisdictions and venues, but it should be, it should be made clear a circle and a company like Circle probably wouldn't have been started successfully in any other country around the world. But the fact that we're now a net exporter of our operating model and business model does require, uh, I think, that the US pay attention to these alternative uh, jurisdictions. There are other places as well. Japan, uh, later in June, will issue broad, comprehensive stablecoin guidance. Hong Kong has come back online um, in a broad way. Um, but, but the innovation ultimately will conform, I think, with all of the rules that we could set forth in this committee and, and I do think it's really critical that the path for digital assets is increasingly shaped by city states as opposed to nation states. And we see that, of course, with New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, and many other jurisdictions around the world. Thank you. Uh, without proper action, I, I certainly fear the U.S. could lose its leading role in digital assets. Um, many stablecoin projects are fleeing the United States for countries that have established clear frameworks for payment stablecoin issuance. And without guidance, I think this problem will only worsen. Um, as a member of the subcommittee, I'm certainly excited to tackle these important issues to make sure that we get it right here in the United States. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back and now recognize the ranking member of the Capital Markets Subcommittee, Mr. Sherman of California, for five minutes. There's a lot of money in crypto and crypto adjacent space. The crypto world makes money by literally making money. Uh, they had it up to $3 trillion. It's dropped down to $1.2 trillion, but $1.2 trillion out of thin air pays for a lot of lobbyists and a lot of propaganda. In my city, the Lakers play at Crypto Arena. They do not play at Know Your Customer Arena. They do not play at Enforce Our Tax Laws Arena. They do not play at Prevent Drug Dealers from Being Able to Get uh, their uh, financial transactions handled arena. Um, we have a very good payment system. We have an excellent currency. The entire world uh, tends to like the dollar. It's a good store of value, a good measure of value, a good means of transaction. Our payment system, you got Apple Pay, comes right out of your checking account. It's not as good as what the crypto world promises they'll deliver in some future decade, but it's way better than what the crypto world delivers now, and I am sure that uh, uh, payment systems using the dollar will get better. So what is the problem? The problem is it's damn hard to cheat on your taxes, and it's damn hard to run a drug sales operation with the U.S. dollar, because we've got know your customer, and we've got anti-money laundering, and we need a payment system that meets the needs of the millions of Americans, or at least the hundreds of thousands of Americans who want to engage in major illegal activity. Uh, and my God, other countries are moving forward with this, and we got to catch up with them. Peru's ahead of us in cocaine manufacture in, in cocaine cultivation. China's ahead of us in organ harvesting, and it's time for America to catch up. Uh, I'll ask, uh, I can barely read uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Hood, if I can see that far. Um, if we allow every state to have its own rules, uh, and say a state like Wyoming, which doesn't have that many people, and uh, cows don't always sell for as much as you'd like, if they could make a billion dollars by just having a regulatory system that was perfect for tax evaders, um, what would stop them? Thank you. Um, currently, nothing would stop them um, because there is no overarching um, 
equivalent federal um, regulatory um, framework, and we would continue to see a race to the bottom, which is not what what efficient. yes, what for the payment system needs is re regulation so that you can be sure that while you're hiding your money from the IRS. Um, and, and that's the big market for this. I mean, drugs are important. Uh, sanctions evasion is important. But uh, the IRS has testified that there's a trillion, nearly a trillion dollars of unpaid taxes every year, almost exclusively from the very wealthy. And in order to not pay a trillion in taxes, you need to hide a trillion of income, which means over a decade you have to hide $30 trillion of assets. That is a huge, uh, a, a huge market, and uh, I think could be more important to Wyoming than uh, uh, than cows. And of course, it all goes away if your payment system has know your uh, know your customer and anti money laundering uh, uh, provisions. Um, so um, you know, a stable coin. Talk about an oxymoron. Uh, the problem for those who want to use the system is that it's so completely unregulated that they might find that their money in the Bahamas isn't there anymore. So they need regulation to protect those who put their money in while they, at the same time, we don't have know your customer and anti-money laundering. And uh, that is something that I think the state of Wyoming or anyone else trying to uh, uh, provide this service will make sure that there's actually reserves behind the coin, um, but at the same time, the IRS can't find out who owns the coins. So, um, uh, you know, uh, every, every day, drug dealers get cheated because you, they try to buy an, a, a kilo and the scale is deliberately cheated against them. They need regulation too. <coughs> And uh, uh, a fair system to have a concealed currency is what cryptocurrency is all about. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. And now the gentleman, Mr. Flood, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all the witnesses' time and testimony today. As someone who passed the Nebraska in Financial Innovation Act uh, to allow state chartered banks to custody digital assets in my home state, I'm really interested in um, the pathway for states and appreciate uh, Superintendent Harris, you being here today, and your um, testimony. As we think about legislation, can you describe why maintaining a robust role for state regulators is important? Absolutely, sir, and thank you for your question. I think we see the success of the dual regulatory framework on the banking side, and it's something that we should seek to duplicate when it comes to stable coins. I think the, the main virtue is the nimbleness with which state regulators can act. And you see that evidenced in New York with our one-to-one -one reserving requirements. All the things we've talked about here today are already in place in New York because we can move more quickly and stay abreast of developments uh, in the space. In your position, can you tell me other states that you think are at the forefront of stable coins and, and understanding this space and state regulators that have maybe uh, taken some steps to, to be more innovative? Uh, so Illinois has recently announced that they are going to take the New York framework and, and duplicate it in Illinois. I understand that's the case for a number of other states that are exploring that as well. Okay, thank you. It's important that the pathway to becoming a stablecoin issuer remains open for new entrants. And I want to just take a second, um, Mr. Disparte. Do you view the current path for non-banks in the current draft legislation attached to this hearing as achieving this goal? Thank you for the question, Congressman. I do think it is, it is really critical. The United States of America is an outlier among the advanced economies in the world in not having a federal payment system charter. The best alternative we have, if companies like PayPal and Stripe and Apple Pay and all these other services can exist, is state oversight. And I, I do think it's really critical that a circle enjoys competition in the future where a comparably regulated and structured stablecoin might exist, also referencing the dollar. The real next breakthrough is fungibility and interoperability of those payment systems as well. Um, and so preserving a bank and non-bank pathway for digital currency issuance in the country is gonna be really critical. One of the issues that I've dealt with in Nebraska is that we oftentimes don't really appreciate, I think consumers don't appreciate that the word bank comes with 
uh, level of security that you can't get uh, in a lot of countries around the world. Allowing non-bank entities access to the federal payment system is a big step for Congress. It's a big step for this process. It comes with it, FDIC oversight, um, you know, the Federal Reserve. Can you respond to the concerns that someone might have about allowing an entrant into the federal payment system? And um, how, do we, how do we weigh whether or not we do it with a non-bank entity? Which I really think is an open question. I'm concerned about it. I'd like to know your thoughts. Again, here too, if you want to really understand the competitiveness gap the United States faces, this, the, the inability for the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve Board, to provision federal services to non-bank actors is an enormous gap. Again, we're an outlier compared to the United Kingdom, Europe, Singapore, many other countries around the world. And indeed, the digital currency space race analogy is precisely that. There's 114 central banks around the world representing 95% of global GDP developing solutions around this digital currency question. And that could include the provision of central bank custody for cash reserves. We've just, we're on the cusp of launching FedNow in the United States. If FedNow is going to work, FedNow has to be provisioned to non-bank actors. The banks, I hate to say it, have no incentive in competing past net, you know, uh, fee interest incomes. Right? To be banked is expensive in this country. To use basic payment services is expensive in this country. And we exact the highest fees from the people who could afford it the least for very basic services. Those services, I might add, also enjoy a public backstop. The last time we socialized uh, you know, uh, losses to trillions of dollars was in bailing out the very banking system. We just saw three of them bailed out recently. And so payments competition is critical. Legitimizing it at the federal level would merely level the playing field between the United States and other countries. Do you think that non-bank entities then would also welcome all of the all of the steps that we uh, require, like uh, federal FDIC insurance, uh, the exams? I mean, one of my concerns, and I think it's an, an honest concern, is if we let non-bank entities enjoy the benefits of of banks, um, that could that could make it difficult. Uh, I think. We can't have a collapse. We can't have a calamity. We, we can't miss uh, for the American consumer. Thank you. I, I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Nebraska. Now calling the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, thanks to all our witnesses. Um, uh, Mr. Desparte, I want to start with you when uh, Mr. Lucas asked you what lessons you learned from this period on March 10th when, you know, that essentially broke the buck, if you will, on stablecoin, and you had mentioned that I think you said it was you were exposed to some risks in the banking sector. I want to challenge you a bit on that because there were no money market funds that broke the buck and they were just as exposed to the banking sector. First question is, do I have it right that you had about $40 billion in cash deposits on March 9th, of which $3.3 billion was it at SVB? Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Have you since that point made any, taken any efforts to increase your dollar holdings, diversify your dollar, I mean, what have you done to protect against the fact that you did have exposure to a part of the banking sector, but not to the majority of your dollar holdings? Yeah, thank you for the question, Congressman. The um, circle prior to the failure of Silicon Valley Bank um, operates, continues to operate what we think of as the safest dollar settlement infrastructure on the internet. USDC's entire composition. And, and, I'm, and, and just like, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be rude. I don't want to get into a whole pitch for like circle. I'm just trying to understand did you take measures to increase sure. the diversity or liquidity of your dollar holdings? Sure. The, the, today, the cash component of USDC is held at a, a large cash custodian, uh, New York bank. And the remainder, the, typically 80% of USDC is short dated US treasuries. Okay. Of 90 days or less. O okay. Um, and what was the volume of, was there a significant volume of loss on the trading during that period before you got back to the dollar peg? The, um, well, yes, USDC lost about uh, $10 billion of circulation, um, but we think of it as uh, fulfilling the right that the coin holder has of redemption at par for a US dollar, even in a situation of extreme stress in the banking system. The three banks that failed had connectivity to the digital assets industry, although their failure wasn't well, caused by the industry. I understand. So I asked that question, and now I just want to put a question to all of you. And I was going to, I was going to ask you to all be New Yorkers in 1975, but then I realized some of you may be conflicted out from that question. So let me ask instead that you are all Michiganders in 2013. 
Um, the largest city in your state's about to go bankrupt. You were all the treasurer of Michigan. Um, would you support legislation that would allow states to print paper money issued by the state of Michigan with a peg to the US dollar without any approval from the Fed that would allow you to print your way out of the bankruptcy of Detroit? Would you support, would any of you support that legislation or would that feel like moral hazard to you? So I'll answer that one and say, one, no, you shouldn't be having unbacked instruments, but two, there are- No, no they're, no, they're backed. They're backed by the Fed. We're going to mandate that the Fed has to fully back that, that Michigan dollar. So I would say I think the model you should think about in this context is things like prepaid cards or money market funds, which you no, reference, so look, no. I, I'm, I'm just asking, should you be able to print, as we did before the Civil War, just have states print currency, but then say that the federal, that the federal government is gonna backstop that currency? I mean, it feels like a big moral hazard to me, right? I mean, you would, you would create a bunch of, now the reason I ask that is because section 103 of the draft legislation says that the, a stable coin issuer could ask for approval from a state. That state would then have, the, the, could then choose to accept that and the Federal Reserve would have to approve that within 60 days. The Fed would have no backstop. So you could have a situation, I mean look, it's currency, right? You, you could have a situation under section 103 of this rule where if I am a state, if I'm New York in 1975, if I'm Michigan, or if I'm the next state that's facing a fiscal crisis, I can just say, can somebody please issue a stable coin so that I can back my way through this and dump all the risk on the American taxpayer? Yeah, I would say that is the value of the reserve guidelines that are also within this bill, is that to create a stable coin. No, 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 no but, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking, should the Fed not have the right, if we are going to give the Fed the obligation to backstop that risk, mm -hmm. and, and the reason I framed this by starting about the circle question is the money market funds did not blow up because for better or for worse, there's a Fed backstop. Ms. Head, with the time I have remaining, do you, do you have any thoughts on how we might improve this legislation to remove the moral hazard? Absolutely, um, we need that clear backstop and the Federal Reserve um, minimally has to have the ability to reject um, applications um, that don't come up to par. Okay, well I, I would hope at a minimum we can improve this legislation by making sure that that if, if we're going to put that obligation on our federal government, the federal government should have some authority to say whether or not they're willing to accept. Thank you, yield back. I thank the gentleman yield uh, to Mr. Nickel for five minutes. Th thank you, um, thank you all for being here today. I, I share the same concerns as ranking members Water and Lynch and agree that we need to ensure robust consumer protections when it comes to digital assets. I also want to thank Chairman Hill for holding today's hearing and I look forward to working on bipartisan stablecoin legislation. After our committee's hearing with SEC Chair Gensler yesterday, it's still evident that there's a lack of clarity in regulation impacting the digital assets industry. Without clear rules of the road, this innovative technology could head overseas where we can't protect investors. I'm committed to working in a bipartisan way to make progress wherever we can on this issue. Uh, Mr. Travinsky, how would effective stablecoin legislation bring more clarity to the way digital assets are regulated? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I think uh, stablecoin legislation would bring clarity in two ways. Um, one, specifically, it would provide clear rules of the road for stablecoin issuers as to how they can set up their businesses and put these products into market here in the United States, subject to American principles. And so that, as Congressman Foster asked earlier, they would be required to freeze assets uh, if it were required in order to keep illicit actors and other bad actors out of the crypto ecosystem. I think that's very important. But secondly, it would also send a message that the United States is open for business to this technology. That's not the message that the industry has been receiving from many other regulators so far who have been substituting their own judgment about the value of digital assets for Congress's judgment. But indeed, it is Congress's role to answer the major question of how digital assets should be regulated, and I think that Congress should begin with stablecoin legislation. Thank you. Um, Mr. Disparte, next to you. Uh, I understand that the U.S. has an opportunity with stablecoins to reinforce the dominance of the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. 
This comes at a time when the status of the dollar is under threat by foreign adversaries like China and Russia. Um, Mr. Desparte, can you provide some examples of how stable coins have improved cross-border transactions and empowered those living in economically disadvantaged countries? And can you please explain how stable coins may enable individuals and businesses across the globe to transact in US dollars? Thank you for the question, Congressman. One of the most powerful examples is a very recent one, um, which is our partnership with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. Uh, Circle, together with Stellar and MoneyGram, as I shared in my written testimony, um, helped design a, a sort of digital cash assistance program for Ukrainian refugees. Uh, this program worked in a manner that no other alternative payment system could have supported, which is that if you think of the way we as a country move foreign aid today or disaster assistance, it's pallets of physical cash, which are literal honeypots for corruption, bribery, and fraud. The idea that you have device-centric money that is corruption-resistant, near-instant, and auditable is a very powerful feature. And the stablecoin, a dollar-denominated stablecoin, in this case USDC, is the payload that supports that innovation. Thank you. Um, public blockchains offer a revolutionary solution to our current financial system. Public blockchains can be accessed by anyone in the world who has an internet connection and are faster, less expensive, more reliable, and more transparent than legacy payment rails. But as we have seen, the, the value of various cryptocurrencies is volatile when compared to many currencies, especially the US dollar. Mr. Dravinsky, how do stable coins differ? Stable coins combine the best of both worlds of the traditional financial system and public blockchains. They take the benefits of the public blockchain, efficiency, security, reliability, and accessibility, and then combine that with stable value. Now, many other types of digital assets, like cryptocurrencies, are volatile against the US dollar. Now, that's not to say there aren't great reasons why people should use those assets for any number of purposes in a decentralized environment, but for the purpose of payments, it's best to have an asset that is stable against a national currency so that it can be used to exchange for goods and services without worrying that tomorrow the price of what you bought yesterday is gonna be way higher or way lower. So with stable coins, we get all the benefits of the technology without that issue of volatility. Thank you so much, uh, yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. I want to thank our witnesses for being an excellent panel today. I thought the conversation was very helpful to clarifying the direction to take on stablecoin legislation. I certainly have heard unanimity from the panel that a regulatory framework designed by Congress is something that would benefit the U.S. economy and, and U.S. investors and consumers. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to each witness for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing is adjourned.